Back it up. The present day mail system of the United States has a long and interesting history. Before the United States was independent of British rule, mail was delivered throughout the colonies by postal carriers on horseback. Beginning in 1673, mail was delivered between Boston and New York. Riders passed through forests using axes to mark trees with slashes which served as signs to other postal riders behind them. Our first official mail system was established by passage of British Post Office Act of 1710, known as Queen Anne Act. The system lasted through the Revolutionary War and was revived in 1789 by the new United States Congress. The colonial postal system under the Queen Anne Act had room for improvement. For example, mail wasn't always delivered directly to a person's doorstep. Into the late 18th century, mail was delivered to taverns, inns, or public gathering spots. It was up to the people to go to these locations and pick up their mail, since there were no official post office buildings in every town or village. A British colonist by the name of Benjamin Franklin was appointed the Crown's postmaster in 1737. Under Franklin, the postal service changed for the better. He traveled 1,600 miles inspecting post offices. After this, he suggested changes be made. A weekly mail wagon delivered the post between Philadelphia, the largest city in the colonies, and Boston. Postal riders would travel in relays and ride both day and night. As a result, mail delivery times between cities were cut in half and the Crown's postal system profited. Years later, as the Revolutionary War approached, Franklin was dismissed from his job due to the activities in the Revolution. Franklin didn't have to wait very long for a chance to get his old job back. In 1775, the new Continental Congress appointed him Postmaster General of the newly United Colonies. A lot of people think of Benjamin Franklin as our nation's first Postmaster General. That's not true. After the U.S. Constitution was adopted in May of 1789, President George Washington appointed Samuel Osgood as the first Postmaster General under the Constitution. In 1789, there were only 75 post offices, 2,000 miles of post roads, and a mere 26 post riders. Those numbers have greatly increased today, but the post office has always had one main purpose to deliver mail from one place to another. The mail has been transported in many different ways throughout our history, on foot, by horseback, stagecoach, ship, train, automobile, aircraft, balloon, pneumatic tubes, and even missiles. Beginning of the 19th century, stagecoaches carried mail at a slow pace traveling over corduroy roads. These were post roads paved with logs that had been cut down and stacked side by side. This made for an unpleasant trip. In 1823, the post office began using steamboats to carry mail. Ten years later, Congress declared waterways official post roads, which gave post office the power to maintain and increase its use of mail boats. By 1831, the mail office began using railroads to carry mail. These iron horses carried mail only for short distances at first. After the passage of the Act of July 7, 1838, Congress officially designated railroads as post roads. The world's first transcontinental railroad began construction in 1863 and was completed on May 10, 1869 at Promontory Summit, Utah. The horseless wagon was tested in 1899. The post office was in search of a faster and cheaper way to get mail to the people. The horseless wagon was an automobile that was used in Buffalo, New York, and New York City. Two years before railroads were constituted as post roads, post offices had awarded its first mail contract to the railroads. This helped promote the delivery of mail by rail. Mail by rail started out only short distances. Mail deliveries evolved 
into a better way of mail transportation. Post offices started to call these rail cars RPO cars. That stood for Railroad Post Office. The RPO cars would sort the mail into bags depending on what city the bag was assigned. Then, when they stopped in the next city, they would drop it off, but they didn't always stop in every city. Only the big ones with a lot of mail. They still had to get the mail to the smaller ones, too. That's when catching the mail on the fly came about. We recently interviewed Lee Nelson, a former RPO worker, about his experiences on RPO cars. What was it like to be an RPO employee? To be an RPO employee was interesting. Uh, it was hard work. Um, it paid well, so because it paid well and I was young, uh, it was fun. Now, fun is not really like fun, but because of the money and because I had the energy to do it, that's why I use the term fun, yes. Did you enjoy your job? What about, what about it? Like? The hardest part of the job probably was when I was off my main line. The main line, I was assigned to the B&O. But whenever, the first two years I was a substitute. So as a substitute, I could be assigned to other train lines, like the New York Central, the Pennsylvania, the Illinois Central. Well, when you're on another train line, you're a foreigner to them, so you get all the hardest work. So that was the hardest part of the job. How did the shifts work out for you? Did you get to pick your shifts? No. When your dispatcher calls you, he tells you what time the train leaves, and you have to be on it, whatever shift that is. What did you think when you had to start having a gun during your shifts? That was interesting because I had never even touched a gun. And when they gave me a gun, they also gave me um, training with the gun, but it was just a gun. I was afraid to take it home because I had two kids, so I would put the gun high up on one shelf, I'd put the bullets high up on another shelf in another room, so um, otherwise it wasn't a big deal. What did you do on the RPO train? What was your job? My job was to do the same, basically the same thing they did in the post office receive mail from stop to stop, uh, sort the mail, sort the letters, sort the packages, uh, small packages, uh, sort the newspapers, put them in proper bags, lock the bags, and when we got to certain destinations, we would put those bags off, collect new bags. And there was a point where the train didn't stop, we would do a catch the mail on the fly situation. And you would throw the mail out for the people that are waiting to receive the mail. As the train went down the track, you caught the mail hanging out on the, on the crane. That's what that was like. That was an interesting job, too. Did you ever have to use your gun for on the train while, while no, you were working? No, never. And um, in the four years I was on the train, none of the men I ever worked with ever had to use their gun. At the end of the shift, we had to unload our guns. We could wear it into town or put it in our bags, but it couldn't be loaded. So one day, one of the guys was unloading his gun and he was dry firing it, just pulling the trigger, and there was a bullet in there and he shot a great big hole in the letter case. But that was the only time I saw a gun get fired outside of the firing range. Did you get brakes? And what did you do on the brakes? We did not have brakes. We had lunch. Remember, the train is moving and we're still going from city to city while we're having lunch. So consequently, we're always getting more mail in. Did you ever get in trouble by your boss or anyone you worked with? <laughs> Not specifically. When you do the catch the mail on the fly, uh, when I first learned how to do that, I missed a bag. That was not a good thing. And um, when you miss a bag, um, you get a letter from the post office explaining how to do that job correct the next time. Uh, as far as the men on the, in the car, well, we got along pretty well. Most of the men in the mail car got along well. What happens if you get sick and can't come? 
Then you call your dispatcher as quickly as you can. He'll try to get another person to fill in. Actually, that's, what, that's how I wound up being on the train because when I was working for the post office, a man from Memphis got sick in Chicago off the train. So they asked over the loudspeaker, they asked for a volunteer to go to Memphis on the mail train. I volunteered and that's how I wound up being in the train in the first place because somebody else got sick. Did you get any training? We had training with the gun. Um, the, the largest post office in the world, the Chicago Post Office, at that time had a had a um, uh, firing range on the 10th floor. And most of the people in Chicago uh, did not know it was up there. Uh, that's where we had to go train, on the 10th floor of the Chicago Post Office, yes. Lee Nelson ultimately lost his job due to several reasons. The Postal Service was losing money on the RPO system. RPO wasn't making any money because they were spending it all on fuel. They had also spent their money fixing the trains. Post offices didn't make enough money to pay it back. Since the program wasn't making a profit, the Postal Service looked into other options to deliver mail. On February 10, 1941, the Postal Service began the HPO system or Highway Post Office. Buses were used to transport mail from one location to another with employees sorting mail in transit. The HPO system grew as it took advantage of the 42,000 miles of new interstate highways being constructed under President Eisenhower's Federal Highway Act, which was signed into law on June 29, 1956. After World War II, Air transportation became more common. Today, we don't use airplanes for transporting mail as much, but we do transport people from place to place more often. Zip code is a five-digit number that gives the location of an area. Later, in 1983, Zip plus four came into play. It gave the exact location of a place. More than 10,000 RPO mail carriers stopped their engines because of zip code. Many people lost their jobs because zip code became more popular than RPO. This was a major change in the mail transportation system. Present day mail is still transported through zip code. Although zip code is a very good way of mail transportation, we still don't know what the future holds for U.S. mail transportation.